Um, before we begin for today, I just want to thank um, all the people who have helped make this possible. Um, first and foremost, the National Endowment for the Arts uh, for their support of Wavelengths, uh, this conference for many years. Uh, we also want to thank Global Fest funders, uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the New York Department of Cultural Affairs, the Consulate General of Canada, New York, and many individual donors and members, many of whom are in the chat and in the room uh, right now. Our, we're starting today uh, with an opening reflection uh, from Gargi Shinde, um, who we're so excited to have with us. She's the Director of Grant Programs um, at Chamber Music America, um, where she leads CMA's seven flagship programs, uh, distributing over one and a half million dollars in grants to the small ensemble music field. Uh, she's committed to racial and gender equity in the arts and is a contributor to the retool racial equity in the panel process, uh, which is a resource to achieve racial equity in the grants review and selection process of artists and arts organizations. Uh, she brings with her today 20 years of experience uh, in the arts world and in the performing arts, specializing in education, programming, curation, pretty much everything under the sun, artist development, digital media, uh, reading through her bio uh, last week, that seems like there's really nothing she can't do or hasn't done. Uh, and so we're so excited to have her today. Um, and with that, I will ask her to take it away. Ian, thank you so much for that warm introduction. And I, and I chuckle with my own hybrid <laughs> career path uh, and some, some, some insights I'm hoping to share. Hello, everyone. And thank you to uh, Global Fest, its founders, Scout and Catherine, and everybody listening here today. I know there are friends uh, in the audience, uh, in, in, in this virtual audience. My work as the director of grants programs involves understanding the conditions first that foster or are an obstacle for the creative development in an artist's career. And with the artist at the center, um, I learn about their unique community within which they thrive and the audiences for whom they create this music and the audience that becomes their archive, you know, their, their living archives of their work as well. I also work in, in trying to intervene in the industry demands placed on the artist. And, you know, without the artist, really nothing else exists. So that is the center of our ecology. I welcome you to type your questions as they come up, and hopefully we'll have a conversation that can enable us to reimagine a new future in our collective work in this, in this unusual time, unusual and unprecedented time. I understand that members of our greater global community may be in attendance today, and, and I see many of them, and also a dear friend who's attending uh, from India, Bombay, Zunan Khan, a tremendous sitarist, and also uh, my, my brother, uh, and I'm uh, very, very happy to see, see this global reach, truly. And I will make, I promise to make references about the industry, about this time that we're going through, uh, that will align with a more universal approach towards a more just ecology for music practice and presentation. If something feels unclear, do not hesitate to type that in. And, um, you know, I will, I will offer clarity. So I want to share, I want to begin with sharing a photograph with you. Like many, many people at this time, I too am seeking inspiration and the strength to go on to make meaningful interventions in the field that I serve. I'm surrounded by the world's greatest artists, but one that has held a distinct place in my imagination is Rudolf Nureyev. Nureyev was ballet's greatest paradoxes. His origins as a poor rural Muslim boy in the Soviet Republic, skirting starvation in cold winters, juxtaposed with his industry that is pervasively culturally homogenous and reports close to 750 million in annual revenues, ballet. We could not have augured his ascent as one of ballet's greatest icons, let alone allow him the mere pursuit of a life in the arts. Yet, with the willing and unwitting complicity of his mother, Farida, and his own defined passion and total dedication toward his art, no male dancer has been credited with more influence at the art form, its history, its style, its reception than Rudolf Nureyev. Throughout my own 20-year career, 
a path molded equally by iconic gurus and iconoclastic mentors. The figure of Nuriyev was a metaphor for otherworldly prowess in my mind, but he embodied the fatal human flaw as the Greek gods would call it. And that was the character of defiance. In my mind, this raised him to the figure of the mythic hero. Nuriyev was defiant in the face of cultural, economic, and gender constructs, geography, opportunity, political confinement, and defiant even of himself as the body begins to fail the dancer, but ultimately defiant in his battle against AIDS as his final staging of the ballet La Bayader only a few months before his death proved to be his most successful. The main thing is dancing, he said, and before it withers away from my body, I will keep dancing till the last moment, till the last drop. Throughout history, the great human impetus to transform the spectator or the listener through artistic experience has revealed the path of defiance. Black American music traditions of blues, jazz, gospel, hip hop, including every art form in every part of the world and those belonging to indigenous people that have survived the surveilling and the curtailing during colonialism. Even heritage classical and folk forms and practice today have survived periods of state mandated bans. All of this embodies defiance. In fact, our gathering here today with you all, acknowledging the sh sheer diversity of practitioners representing genres, dis disciplines, and cultures is a testament to the collective moment of defiance at every single performance. And so I am speaking to many mythic heroes today. But our defiance is towards the emancipatory. Right? It's towards celebration, not the kind of nihilistic defiance of the anti-masker in a pandemic. You know, just like Nuriyev's artistic medium, his body in this Richard Avedon photo of him, his stance is of physical defiance for the limits of human movement, but towards a celebration of something beautiful in the pursuit of human celebration. I find that defiance rather than resilience, a word we tend to use more frequently in a crisis, best defines our zeitgeist. It continues to serve me in a time of unprecedented personal loss, as well as a catastrophe in the community of artists I most love and serve in my day-to-day -day work. At what moment have we arrived through this enduring COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, we are in a catastrophe, but not in the everyday sense of a disaster. In fact, I would like to bring you closer to the original meaning of the word catastrophe, which came to us from performance in the Greek theater. Katastrophein, you know, with, the, with the letter K, is the moment in Greek tragedy where the hero will suffer the ultimate reversal, a moment of unraveling through which we will move towards a more truthful outcome and a resolution in the story. You know, we are at that moment. You know, there has been tremendous unraveling and now we are about to come through to the truth. In the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico also taught us that survival lay not in only resilience, but in embracing the catastrophic moment, embracing catastrophe. I had planned to share with you a very short presentation created by the um, Washington Post about artists um, in Puerto Rico who were working through darkness because even after five months after Hurricane Maria hit the island, almost a quarter of a million population on the island was living in complete and total darkness without any power. This was also the time my advocacy with Puerto, Rican, uh, with, with Puerto Rico for their musical artists had just begun. We just tried to understand under what circumstances they were they were functioning. And, and I'm so sorry, this, this is an old presentation and it's not working today, but the gist of it is that when the music stopped, when the lights went off and when everybody came together, you have to remember this, this the Hurricane Maria was not the first, um, you know, disaster they had encountered. After they made sure everyone had been fed, they all shared their food, children, elders had been taken care of. There was just complete silence on the island. 
So the musicians pulled out their instrument and they started playing in the local public square. And this was a moment of calm and peace and some amount of restoration of the human soul that artists provided to this island that was gutted in this, in this catastrophic moment. The presentation also covers a lot of the theater artists who started to uh, just theater artists and circus artists who went into the more rural areas on the island to bring some celebration, some joy, some idea of catharsis into the lives of these, these rural uh, inhabitants on the island who had just completely been cut off from any mainland resource. And this is how Puerto Rico has been not only resilient, but also defiant in the face of what they were given. And remember, America's colonial relationship with the island and the passing of the Jones Act prevents them from even receiving aid from other countries. Right? This is a very difficult situation for the island. But this is, this is the, what we've learned from them, is that we have to embrace the catastrophe and come through it. This particular catastrophe, this moment of darkness in our own field has also shed light on major moral and infrastructure failings for what is a richly diverse arts ecology in any part of the world, the industry and the individual artist. We discovered that most, out, most of us outside the salaried sectors in the arts, including artists, managers, producers, production crew, agents, are functioning in a largely unregulated art industry, no guaranteed performances, no labor protections, no health, no pension plans, and a very limited federal investment in the development of the arts, but also in the education of the, of the arts. The United Kingdom in 2020 spent over 4 billion in cultural expenditure. This was for the cultural needs of a 68 million population. Now keep this, keep this figure in your mind, 4 billion for, for 68 million population, right? And the United States has proposed for 2022, 201 million for the NEA. And our population is approximately 329 million. So think about, think about this. Big Technology's intent is to obliterate any fair chance of digital distribution or revenue from royalties. Our conservatory students graduate with a significant amount of debt due to our own education system. Then they incur further debt to self-produce and self-produce recordings. And now we're in the space where artists need to navigate big tech firms, uh, big tech terms like NFTs and blockchains. We're using these, we're compelling artists to understand what this is without even evaluating what they mean or whether they're even relevant to the artist's creative process. We did not need the pandemic to take place for these conditions to remain fixed in the lives of musicians and the ecology of cultural workers that supports them. What in fact remains a constant before and after the pandemic is the total disenfranchisement of the artistic community from the knowledge base around the landmark decisions in the industry. And I'm gonna share some of these links with you because I would really, really like us collectively as, an, as, as workers in the space to understand what these are. So I want you to think about the idea of defiance towards the emancipatory, towards, towards some solution, collective solution, right? Being an artist gives you the great privilege of solitude in creation. But at this moment, it is only collective action that will take the defiance towards the emancipatory, towards any kind of change. And that has to be our survival attitude. I work with artists and producers every single day and I find that a majority are not aware of the structures around licensing rights, the Music Modernization Act, uh, there's a sync panel at the conference, definitely attend that. Um, and, and even if you're an artist right now listening in who's not in the United States, all of this is relevant. Visit all these links, understand these structures that are being created because in a globalized society, this impacts us all, especially first world legislations and, and bills. Um, a majority are even aware of the way the arts are funded in the United States. In fact, my experience with the industry members is that they are largely uninterested in funding structures. This is a kind of a pressure cooker situation, you know. We who are 
sort of the culture workers are completely dependent on artistic creation. There is nothing without the artistic creation. The artist is the center. The artist conversely is dependent upon us to generate uh, opportunities to generate taking the work out into the audience and even expanding their work further, right? At this moment, both these groups are without any access to resources. So we're, we're sort of in this pressure cooker situation of, of dependency. So we have to really understand collectively what it is we can do together. Professionals within my own sector of grant making are scrambling, rapidly working to reform grant making practices. You have to understand multi-million dollars of private philanthropy funding has not made it into the hands of black, brown, and indigenous artists, roughly 50 years of institutional support since this system of investment started in black private philanthropy. That's half a century of underfunded arts ecologies. You know, we're, we're, we're one of the most powerful nations in the world. But because we are a heavily regulated system, as nonprofits are, and bound to the best practices determined by the attorney generals and the IRS, change comes a lot slower in our work. But most importantly, what I've observed is we have no artist collective action talking back to us. The only time we saw that was during the advocacy with Puerto Rico. It was a group of artists and, and culture workers who came into my office and said, Gargi, we have to do something about this. The island cannot be an absent space in the funding landscape. You know, this is the first time I saw collective action coming from outside, right? Normally I go into communities, I go into, uh, you know, collectives of artists to learn how it is they practice their art forms, what are the resources missing from them? So we need to have this dialogue, you know, between structures that are, are funded, structures that have the funding resources and what really are the artists' needs. You know, if you focus all your confusion and, and disempowerment on big technology, that is something even I cannot solve, then it's going to keep us constantly feeling the pressure of something we cannot fix. But if we, if we just strategically change our focus on, on what is around us, you know, I think change will come. Then I'm, I'm a big believer of change. I would not be doing this work if I didn't believe change is possible. And I have seen it through my work as well. So building a knowledge base is going to help us all come up with more efficient and collective actions. It enables the individual artist to feel more empowered and be enables better connectivity of skills distributions in the industry, right? So most artists I, I've come across with do not want to take on the administrative burdens of booking tours, um, curating festivals, scheduling calendars. They hate grant writing most of all. You know, they would much rather spend every spare moment of their craft, uh, on their craft. And this is the universal desire of the artist, total dedication to their craft. In one of my most recent programs at Chamber Music America, we had a question on the forum to learn about audiences. We asked the artists, you know, who, who are your immediate audiences? And most conservatory artists were unable to answer who it is they make the art for. Most responses led us down the road of artists wanting to gain critical acclaim. But it is the heritage artists working locally in their communities who were able to answer these questions with profound truths. You know, native artists, even the conservatory graduates there are crystal clear about what the arts mean to their communities and their children who will become future audiences and preservers of the tradition. And I have to tell you, even the big, well-funded organizations are not as clear about their audience development as these native artists are. Um, you know, you have to think about how that poor rural Muslim boy in the remote village of Ufa, how was he exposed to performance and then became Rudolf, the Rudolf Nureyev that we knew. And, and you know, the, seven, the $700 million industry revenue that built around him and you know, around icons like him. You know, he had to be exposed to the arts. And, and sadly, our attitude in the United States towards arts education is, is uh, one that, that leaves a lot to be desired. We have many, many obstacles to bringing the arts to children. And it's often the, the local artist in their community who is performing for children, for the elders, for everyone who is not usually part of the concert going experience. 
So this also revealed a fissure for us. You know, we saw that the artist is completely distant from the idea of community. You know, this was this was a real, real. This took, took me by real surprise. So I'm going to uh, share uh, 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 some data with you. You know, presented by it's a Nielsen report on music. It's a 2019 report. Um, bear with me one second here. Sorry, I've just lost my screen. Um, here we go. All right. Um, and we can use, we can choose to read this in two ways, right? We can either say this is the digital market. So I'm going to explain to you what we're looking at. Yeah, this is their understanding. This is their data gathering by Nielsen of what was the digital revenue earned versus actual physical album sales. So I want you to look at the top. It says physical albums, digital albums, digital track sales, and on demand. And that's on demand is your streaming, your, your Spotify's and your iTunes and everything. And at the bottom, it, it shows you a list of the various genres. So I'm gonna just take a quick look at the Latin. Look at the look at the on-demand streaming percentage of consumption there, right? So there are two ways we can look at this. We can either look at this as a simple business report, or we can look at this as you know, consumer behavior, right? We can either look at it as sales or we can look at it as consume, consumption behavior. If you choose to read this as consumer behavior, you are actually more empowered as, as individual artists and cultural producers because each of you brings an audience with you. This audience's experience is connected to what they experienced live. It is connected to your craft uniquely. This phenomenon is, is identical to what I observed when I was creative director of a digital publishing firm. You know, we sold fiction and we were working with the Goliath of digital publishing, Amazon.com. No, we did not sell a million copies. That was not our goal. Our goal was to find our readership and continue to engage our readership. I haven't met a single artist who has said to me, I got into this to make, <laughs> to make a million bucks. <laughs> I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an in-joke everybody here is aware of. You know, we do this because it, there's something greater here. What nobody tells you is how much money and human resource has to be invested in order to sell a million copies of a book. Yeah, but we, were, we, were, we took those titles and we were bestsellers in the specific genres of our unique audiences, our unique readership, historic thrillers, crime, uh, relationship drama, etc. And we understood who they were. And we spent a considerable amount of time understanding who our readers were. Uh, we most importantly understood the talent we were working with, that is the author, right? So in this case, the artist and what that asset was, the talent. And we found ways to make that successful by taking, by selling and optioning book rights for film and television development and, and many other ways, Broadway, you know, all of the others. So, you know, to make that a successful operation, we had to make sure it was in the best interest of the talent as well. You know, it can never work without that. So I want to open this up, you know, with a Q&A with a few thoughts. One is an emergency, but you know, emergency recommendation. If you are in a state where you are functioning in the arts in a way that is not sustainable at this point, you know, you're pushed against the wall, really spending most of your day figuring it out. What's going to change? When will I be relevant again? This is, this is not good. You know, you, you have to break this cycle. And, and, you know, I chuckled in the beginning with Ian's introduction uh, because I, I remembered that when I was 30 years old and I had a tenure track position in the university, I resigned and became an intern, an intern for a very successful businesswoman because I said, I, I met her at a party and I said, I want to simply observe you at work. Allow me to bring you a coffee. Let me become your intern again. You know, because at that time, the industry that education had become was not serving me well at all. So if this has become a space of, of anxiety for you, step away from it. It's, it's perfectly okay. Develop your resume, understand how your skills are transferable, work with a recruiter to help you. Your first duty is to yourself, your loved ones, your mental and physical health, and bringing some stability into your life. 
live music is not going away. As long as we're human and we congregate to celebrate our humanness, your unique skill sets will always be in demand as the viability of this virus weakens with every mutation and there is a clearer horizon. You need to stay alive, you need to stay healthy, and you deserve stability. I've spent the first year of the pandemic losing some of our greatest artists, and, and the sorrow that brought with it, I cannot express adequately. So take care of yourself. The arts are a very erratic field right now. This is the truth. This is a fact. Embrace the catastrophe. Take care of yourself. I look at budgets all day long. That is my job. And I can tell you that the strongest, the strongest organizations that have had reserve funds, they will slowly be the first ones to come back. It is our unique volunteer run communities, presenters, festivals. Those are the ones that are, that, that are possibly going to suffer for a few years. They are the ones who connect the children. They're the ones who connect the elders. They're the ones who take care of who is not in the concert going experience. Those are the ones as funders, we are currently trying to understand their needs. But coming back to it, stay alive, stay healthy, and you deserve stability. Build your knowledge base. And I'm gonna share a few links and I'm gonna tell you what they are before I share them. I want you to read about the lawsuit that Eminem filed, Eminem's company filed against Universal Music Group over digital royalties. It was a landmark case about how licensing transferred over to the digital age without the artist's consent, right? And, and artists had signed their rights. At a time, digital streaming and digital consumption was not a concept. But when the license is transferred, they were automatically given over to these, to these digital companies. You know, this is a very important uh, case law. You must read that. Um, I would like you all to read the music Musical Works Modernization Act, Title I. This is from the US Copyright Office. Again, artists, if you're not in the United States, this is still a very, very important reading you must do. Understand the structures, compare and contrast. That's what I do in my work as well. I understand how the funding ecologies work all over the world. Um, I'd like you to read also, and I'm gonna send you all these links, how the United States funds the arts. It's a phenomenal document produced by the National Endowment for the Arts. It really, really breaks down the history of how the system started. It can be dry reading, but, but I love I love dry reading. Um, I'm a research geek, but but you must just um, definitely, um, you know, understand the basics of it. There are some great statistics in this. It's really a phenomenal document. For the cultural producers here today, Coursera offers a course called the cycle management of successful arts and cultural uh, management of successful arts and cultural organizations this is a free course if you complete the course you get a little uh, you get a little certification at the end of completion this again is a really great introduction you know artists only if you believe you're going to be uh, you know an arts producer as well as a practitioner is this useful um, you know, but, but for the cultural producers, definitely understand it breaks down the structures, it breaks down the regulations. I'm not saying a regulated art, arts ecology is the best ecology. In fact, um, we've seen the opposite of that. We've seen when communities themselves understand their needs, their, their artists, they are the best ones to execute the arts practice. But this is def we're definitely in a capitalist space with arts production. And to not have this knowledge is only going to be, you know, it's only going to be a gap in your knowledge base. If possible, if you have taken care of yourself first, volunteer some time as a board member or as an advisory board member, your skills are very, very valuable. And you bring a lot of insight on this and experience in this field. And I wanna leave you with, with a very, very important thing. Cause I, I quickly, you know, just noticed I, I Somebody said, I'm not tech savvy. I'd like to actually understand that more because my, my, my recommendation to you is to not deal with technology out of a sense of fear. You know, embrace technology. It is going to be the best way to gather data on your audiences, but the best way to transfer data about your audiences to be able to generate some sustainable funding. And so for that, I'm going to also share another, uh, another link called Attracting and Engaging 
and measuring digital audiences for branded content. This is from the New York Times. Um, and I'll, I, I see Ian's back on, so we're probably out of time. Ian, this is my Achilles heel. So I'm, I'm actually going to pause and open it up to a Q&A. We'll, we'll get far better insights. I, will say, I, I think we are a little over time. What I'd love to do is to continue this conversation in the chat. I know that Gargi is going to be putting links in the chat. We're also hosting um, a meet and mix at 5 p.m. today, um, where we're really hoping to continue some of the points of the conversations, sort of everything that we're talking about today, just keep that conversation going. So I think if we can uh, move to the chat for some of this conversation, because we do want to uh, keep the uh, trains running on time a little bit. But I just <laughs> want to thank you so much, Gargi, for that truly inspiring uh, conversation and so many great calls to action. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I put so many quotes uh, down as I was, you know, dancing to the last moment, I think was uh, something that you, you said when you were speaking in the beginning. And I feel like I just will carry that with me uh, for the rest of the day. And I think uh, it was so beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it, it, is, it is my greatest pleasure and I'm available. I'll be there at five in, but also if anybody needs to reach me, I'll share my email. I'm available for this community at any time. It is a community I deeply, deeply love. So thank you with, with all the humility for inviting me and allowing me to share some insights here. Absolutely, thank you so much for joining us.